Welcome back, everyone. Surah 434, sometimes affectionately known as the wife-beating verse, has been hotly debated in the history of Muslim interpretation. It's a problematic verse, to be sure, for many reasons. Is it the most problematic verse in the Quran for Muslims? Well, I don't know, but it's probably a top contender. Let's start by reading it. Men are in charge of women by right of what Allah has given one over the other and what they spend for maintenance from their wealth. So righteous women are devoutly obedient, guarding the husband's absence what Allah would have them guard. But those wives from whom you fear arrogance, first advise them. Then if they persist, forsake them in bed and finally strike them. But if they obey you, once more, seek no means against them. Indeed, Allah is ever exalted and grand. Just a quick note on the brackets. They indicate that the disciplinary action is sequential. However, grammatically, that is not necessarily the case. Many of you are probably familiar with the alleged incident that Muslim exegetes have widely assumed resulted in this verse's revelation. A woman was slapped by her husband. This issue was taken to Muhammad for judgment. Muhammad said that she should retaliate. However, this verse was revealed that says men can hit their wives. Muhammad said, we wished something and God wished something else. What God wishes is best. With that rock-solid historical background explicated, we can survey some Muslim perspectives on this verse with the help of a 2006 article by Muhammad Mahmoud. First, note that the Quran says that men are in charge of women by right of what Allah has given one over the other. Several other translations read something like, Allah has made one of them, referring to men, to excel the other, of course, referring to women. Mahmoud's article describes some ways that Muslim commentators have outlined Allah's preference for men over women. Here's a summary. The great 12th century scholar, Al-Zamakshri, categorized three areas of men's greatness over women. The first is intrinsic, things like reason, prudence, will, and strength. Then there's the social category. Men read more better with the bestest of literacy. They have better military skills, and scholars, like those who tell everyone else how to beat women, are men. Finally, men are imams. They wage jihad, lead the call to prayer, and so forth. He also cites the authors of an influential 20th century commentary, Tafsir al-Manar, for a more modern perspective. For Muhammad Abdu, one of the Tafsir's authors, a man's privilege and power over a woman rest on natural and acquired grounds. The natural argument claims that men have a more mature disposition, are more beautiful, and have superior thinking capacity. That's right, men are more beautiful. The Tafsir even states that one thing that contributes to men's superior beauty over women is their beards. I've had a few thoughts while noticing a Muslim beard, and beautiful is not one of them. Now that we know how men are better than women, we don't have to talk much about the nature of the arrogance, probably better understood as disobedience of the latter. Defining disobedience is a very open category in the Muslim history of interpretation. Also, whether a husband has to know his wife was disobedient or have good reason to think she is or will be is debated. Moving toward disciplinary action, the husband has the right to forsake his wife in bed. Some Muslim commentators have been puzzled by this. If the woman's angry at her husband, not sleeping with him would not be punishment. Thus, Tabari cites some exegetes who have tried to solve yet another riddle in this verse. Some commentators that Al-Tabari cites contend that the phrase is not about forbidding the performance of the sex act itself, but rather a particular manner of its performance. A husband can have sex with his disobedient wife, but should signal his indignation by not speaking to her during the act. Tabri himself suggested that this part of the verse referred to tying the woman up for her punishment. Why not? And as to the beating itself, some have tried to argue that it does not refer to physical violence. This is where the verse gets really problematic. As Mahmoud states in his article, this is one of those rare instances when a believer feels that he or she stands on a different and higher moral plane than that which sacred scripture prescribes. You see, there seems to be something fundamentally wrong with beating a woman, even if she might be disobedient, yet Allah very obviously prescribes it. In response to this moral quandary, Al-Tabri, along with many others, met Allah in the middle and said that beating the wife should not break any bones. Or again, from the more modern perspective, the commentators of Tafsir al-Manar rely on Al-Tabri's material, insisting that the beating should not be harmful. Both commentators, however, go to great lengths in trying to justify beating as a disciplinary punishment. Muhammad Abdu claims that it is neither contrary to reason nor unnatural to beat women, but he quickly adds that this is a measure that can only be justified under exceptional circumstances when the moral fiber of society is seriously undermined. His logic takes it for granted that women are more susceptible than men to the influences of moral depravity. 
For Rashid Ritta, a woman's disobedience opens the floodgates of chaos, and beating is a legitimate and sometimes necessary measure to restore order. Engaging in one of his typical polemics, he dismisses out of hand those who oppose wife-beating, dubbing them as imitators of Westerners, and goes on to open fire on Westerners, whose conduct is, in any case, far from exemplary because they engage in beating their wives. As problematic as this verse is, even the authors of the study Quran balk at saying that this verse is not describing physical violence. Some recent interpretations of strike them seek to avoid the sense of physical hitting entirely by invoking alternate idiomatic meanings of darba to strike. Such interpretations are not entirely convincing, however, since the wider semantic range of darba they invoke is activated only by various prepositions and syntaxes not found in the present verse. Moreover, the occasion of revelation is widely held to be the issue of a man's right to strike his wife, and so one would expect the verse to address this issue specifically. More recently, others have attempted to make this verse cohere with human conscience. For a radical articulation of a virtual abrogation of the beating measure, one must turn to the feminist intervention. That's right, Muslim feminists, a contradiction in terms, if I have ever heard one. Here are a couple of examples. Pakistani Muslim feminist Rifat Hassan says that darba to strike means to hold in confinement. In Mahmoud's article, he calls this a forced interpretation of the verse. American Muslim feminist Amina Wadud says that this particular use of darba ironically prohibits unchecked violence against women. And the Moroccan feminist Fatima Mernissi in her radical reinterpretation calls upon the oppressed women depicted in Surah 434 to affirm their right to rebel. Such examples illustrate well the desperation awaiting anyone trying to read women's rights into Islamic texts. In the end, Mahmoud's article suggests virtual abrogation as a way forward, making me wonder how many different ways there are to abrogate the Quran. A virtual abrogation effectively says to go the route of people with a conscience and don't beat your wives, regardless of what the Quran permits. But even if virtual abrogation is successful and Allah's word in the wife-beating verse is neutralized in practice, many Muslims may still be quite bothered by the fact that Allah put it there in the first place. It shouldn't be, as Mahmoud's article previously said, that a Muslim stands on a higher moral plane than that which sacred scripture prescribes. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.